In this lecture, I discuss this most famous of all Egyptian pyramids and present to you the story of the finding of its hidden royal burial chamber, a story that few people have actually spent the time to research and to briefly touch on its greatest mystery of all, that is, its missing treasures. It doesn't involve aliens from outer space, slaves, ghosts, sacrificial victims, doomed workers, occult chambers, magnetic resonance, or other compelling clickbait. But it is a fascinating story all the same. I plan to take you on a brief tour of the pyramid and its chambers, and hopefully you will leave with a greater appreciation for this justifiably famous wonder of the ancient world. So let's buy our entry ticket and begin our climb inside. As we begin our exploration of the Great Pyramid, let's take a minute first to review our inventory of pyramids that we have studied so far. So we've got the stepped pyramid there on the west side of the Nile River. Just a little south of it is Medum. A little north of it is the Bent Pyramid. And a little north of that is the Red Pyramid. Notice that they were all built in Lower Egypt. Something that many people don't understand about pyramids in Egypt is that all the pyramids were built in the Lower Kingdom. None of them in the Upper Kingdom appear by the Southern Capital. And note that the tombs are all built on the west side of the Nile. That's because west is the direction of death for the Egyptians, given that the sun sets in the west. Also, the cities, the cities of the living, are built on the east side of the Nile, given that the sun is born over the eastern horizon. So, Memphis, the capital city of Lower Egypt, and Thebes, the capital city of Upper Egypt, are located on the east side of the Nile, because east is the direction of life. Now let's take a trip down quickly and just see where these pyramids are located relative to each other. So there is Medum, a little hard to see in Google Earth here, but it's interesting to see how they relate to each other in terms of geography. There's the Bent Pyramid, and not too far away is the Red Pyramid. And then we fly up further north to the Giza Plateau, just to the east of present-day Cairo. And here's where the Great Pyramids are located. Notice that Cairo nearly envelops the Giza Plateau now, the suburbs of Cairo kind of lapping up against the, the base of the plateau. In those days, of course, as you know, Cairo didn't exist. So here we see the two biggest pyramids, Pyramid of Khufu and the Pyramid of Khafre. Here's a, one of the most famous views of the Great Pyramids that we've seen before. And just to identify them again, Khufu to the right, Khafre in the middle, and Menkare off to the left. Now it appears that the Pyramid of Khufu, this one here, appears to be smaller than Khafre. Khufu is actually the largest pyramid, but in this particular case, it appears to be smaller simply because it is resting in a depression. Now, here's an image of Khufu. Uh, interesting to note that he was a son of Sneferu, so Mr. Pyramid, the builder of the Red Pyramid. Uh, and then the very next pyramid is the greatest pyramid ever built, and that is the Great Pyramid of Khufu. So, uh, Kind of interesting how the son far outdoes his father uh, in pyramid building. Notice uh, the sculpture here is rather interesting in that it's only about a four inch tall figurine made of ivory and very badly damaged, eroded, as you can see here. Makes one wonder why this great pharaoh did not have more statues made. Of course he did, but none of them have survived, unfortunately, except for this very small one. So we've got Khufu, who is the father of this dynasty. Khafre is his son, and Menkare his grandson. 
So this dynasty built the greatest pyramids of them all. And it's interesting to note that they were some of the earliest pyramids at the same time. Now we've talked about the, the fact that the pyramids originally were covered with a smooth skin of beautiful white limestone. That has all been removed, as you can see here, with the exception of a little bit on the cap of the Pyramid of Khafre. No one knows why that was left up there, but nevertheless, it's good that it is give us an idea of what the pyramids would have looked like originally. So if we look at a close-up view here, when people see images like this, oftentimes they are surprised because looking at the pyramid from a distance, it looks more or less like it could be fairly smooth, but when you get them up close, it is very rough, huge blocks of stone that are exposed. Of course, they wouldn't have been that way originally, so let's take a look, quick look here at the, at the uh, top of Khafre's pyramid here, just to get a better idea of what this stonework would have been like originally. And even though it still remains here, it, it shows a great deal of weathering and deterioration even so. It's an interesting view of the skin because it gives us an idea of how these pyramids were put together. The inside of the pyramid, the stone that's used on the inside of the pyramid, the, the core, the body of the pyramid, is a very poor quality, typically. Very roughly cut limestone for the interior and rather haphazardly placed, as you can see here. So we get the idea of the uh, nice, smooth, tight-fitting skin on the outside. Then just below that, ranks of fairly regular stone. And then as we get down into the interior, further back inside the pyramid, stone that's rather jumbled. On the surface, though, you get this better quality ashlar limestone, Ashlar meaning that it's cut and shaped, unlike this roughly cut limestone on the interior. Then on top of this roughly laid courses of uh, limestone, we get a better quality ashlar limestone that is carefully laid in level courses. So that's what we are seeing here. And so you can see these uh, courses very carefully laid and kept very level in order to make the pyramid as stable as possible. And then finally, a very high quality white ashlar limestone, very precisely fit, is laid over the top. Like we saw here in my last lecture, very closely fit and precisely cut. Okay, so that would have covered all these pyramids originally. Now also, this has, of course, been weathered by thousands of years of time, so it no longer has the appearance that it once did. So here's an interesting example of the, the way that the stone would have looked originally, because it was not only precisely fit, but polished as well. By polished, I don't mean glossy. Uh, it wouldn't have been that way, of course. But here we can see an example of a limestone block in which a researcher decided to experiment with a block of limestone in Egypt to see what could be achieved by polishing it or by smoothing it, abrading the surface. So here you see the natural block, and here you see what it looks like once it has been ground down smooth. And so you have to visualize all the pyramids being covered with this kind of beautiful white skin that would be shining out in the desert sun like white beacons as memorials to the, to the great pharaohs. So over the years, of course, we've lost the appearance of those pyramids and no longer look as beautiful as they would have originally. So the question might be, what happened to the skin that used to cover all of these pyramids? Well, in the case of the Great Pyramid, we have records that, that that limestone was removed in the mid-14th century A.D., 1356. And it was removed by the Sultan Hassan, ruler of Cairo at that time, in order to build his mosques. Now here is the mosque that was constructed from the limestone skin of the Great Pyramid. So the Madrasa Mosque, one of the largest mosques in the world, and so the stone that you're seeing here was acquired from 
the, the Great Pyramid. And why do that? Well, it's just for economics and ease. In other words, instead of going out to the quarries and cutting new blocks of stone, these pyramids serve as ready-made quarries of stone that has already been cut. And so just send your men out to strip it off and use it for the building of your mosques and other structures within the city of Cairo, which, of course, existed at that time. Here's an interesting image of Menkare. Many people don't really pay much attention to this or notice it, but notice this big gash or slot in the side of the pyramid. It's not an entrance. Okay? It's actually an attempt to demolish the pyramid by, again, a Muslim sultan. So in the 12th century AD, the sultan of Egypt at that time, the son of Saladin, wanted to destroy the pyramids because he felt that they were monuments to unholy practices. And so he sent out his crews of workmen to demolish the pyramids, beginning with the smallest of the big pyramids, to see if they could tear that down. So his workmen labored on the Pyramid of Menkari for eight months. And that's all the further they got in terms of removing the stonework. They simply found it to be too difficult and too time-consuming, and so the attempt was abandoned. So I find that interesting in, as a testament to the, to the ingenuity, the skills, uh, and the techniques of the Egyptian workers that they were able to build these structures that are so difficult to demolish today. So here we see a view of the Great Pyramid of Khufu from ground level, uh, and it makes us aware of just what this huge mountain of stone is like in a sense. This particular view does show us the entrance. So here are these two large beams that are gabled up against one another. That right below those is the entrance into the interior of the pyramid. Now, of course, a stone has been removed from around it, so that's not the way that it would have looked originally, obviously. And again, you have to remember that the surface here would have been covered with that smooth skin. But note right down here at the bottom of the image is dark hole right there. That's the entrance that tourists use to enter into the pyramid today because, of course, you are allowed to enter the pyramid and climb up into the, through the passages and to the king's chamber today. And that's the opening that you would use. So let's take a look at a few factoids about this great pyramid. So it was a 400, originally 480 feet tall. It's lost a little bit of, the, of its height today. So it's not quite that tall now, but 480 feet. Tallest building in the world uh, until the Middle Ages when a medieval cathedral surpassed it with its bell tower. But 480 feet of stone. It has been estimated by scholars that something like 2.4 million blocks of stone were used in its construction, each averaging two and a half tons. Okay. Now we know that this pyramid took 20 years to build, and so by calculating that out, it is almost mind-boggling to realize that in order to get this built in 20 years, one block of two and a half ton limestone had to be laid every two minutes all day long, as long as the sun was up, 10 hours a day, let's say, right? It's almost uh, unbelievable and certainly a testament to the, both the engineering, uh, the general overall stonework expertise, and the site management. Can you imagine how difficult it would have been to organize the workforce in such a way as to get a block of stone laid every two minutes throughout the entire day for 20 years. Uh, again, a testament to the brilliance and ingenuity and tenacity and organization of the Egy Egyptian workmen. Now, the majority of the pyramid, of course, is, is built of limestone blocks but uh, the burial chamber inside and several other areas within the pyramid actually use granite blocks. So the largest of these were 80 tons that had to be moved. 
and these were transported from their quarry, which, which wasn't across the river at Tura, but was upriver near Aswan. So the Aswan quarries provided the best granite, and those were 500 miles up the river. So they had to be cut from the quarry and then transported on large barges down the river to the building site. It has been estimated that some of these large blocks of granite might have taken as much as seven years to cut and smooth each block. Why would it take so incredibly long? Because the Egyptians had no harder metal to work with than copper. And copper does not cut granite. So that begs the obvious question that if copper can't cut granite, then how did they cut them? Okay, let me just tell you, it wasn't alien visitors from outer space giving them laser beams to cut them with. Okay, I will talk about uh, how this granite was cut uh, in a later lecture when we talk about the obelisks. So I'll pick up that subject a little bit later on. Okay, so let's do a fadeaway view here to show you one of the most unique features of the Great Pyramid of Khufu, and that is atypically the tomb of the Pharaoh is inside the pyramid, somewhere near mi the middle of the pyramid. Now remember we talked about how conservative Egyptians were in terms of uh, their traditions, and the tradition for a burial structure was that the tomb was below ground. And virtually all of the pyramids that were built do have their tombs below ground, except for this one. Now there's no explanation as to why Khufu had his tomb built in the, near the center or in the middle here of the, of the pyramid. No explanation for that at all. Lots of guesswork by today's theorists and so on, but no one really knows why he had his tomb, the final spot for his tomb, uh, built in that particular location. So this is very unusual for a, a pyramid of the pharaohs. So let me identify the various parts of this for you before we take our little tour. So the entrance is there, and as I showed, showed you that photograph earlier, it's not at ground level. It's some 30 feet up the side of the pyramid. So uh, in order to get into the, the tomb passages, the corridors, the ancient Egyptians had to somehow carry the coffin up to this point and then into the, into the body of the pyramid. How they did that, we don't know necessarily. Today, you just climb up there, climb up the, the blocks of stone uh, with stairs and so forth to get up to the entrance. But this is where the entrance is, is up on the side of the pyramid, which is true of virtually all pyramids. Then you've got the so-called descending passage that leads downward. And note, of course, that it goes below ground, as tradition dictates. And then at the bottom of that uh, passage, you've got the underground, so-called underground chamber, which is a burial chamber. However, this is unfinished. And so Khufu began having this, his burial chamber carved from uh, the bedrock, as was tradition. But before it ever got finished, it was, a halt was put to it. And instead, his cha burial chamber was moved into the body of, of the pyramid. Okay. So the next feature is the as so-called ascending passage which uh, j joins the descending passage right here and then leads upward. And to begin with, this part up here didn't exist. So to begin with, they made a horizontal passageway over to what we now call the Queen's Chamber. So an alternate uh, burial chamber. This one is pretty much finished, but was never used to bury the Pharaoh. Again, we don't know why. Uh, this was abandoned, and the building went up on around it. Now remember, as we talked about with building uh, the pyramid, the brief look at, at the building of the Great Pyramid, as the courses of stone rose, that's when they built these structures here. They didn't build the pyramid 
first and then come in and excavate those things out. It was all planned out in advance so that as the stone rose, these corridors, passages, and chambers were left free. Okay, then we have the Grand Gallery, this very tall uh, structure here that leads on up to the burial chamber, and then finally the King's Burial Chamber here uh, near the middle of the pyramid. There are some other elements here that we'll take a look at, but that's, a, uh, that's enough to, to begin our tour. Okay, so we're going to start with the opening, with the entrance. So now, like I said, this, is the, this was the original entrance here, where these gabled blocks, there are these gabled beams lean up against each other to provide an opening for the, for the uh, entrance, which was down here. However, this is the entrance that tourists use today, where this guard is standing. You can see again these huge blocks of stone that were used to build the structure. Notice that the very lowest ones are larger than, than the higher ones. It gets smaller as they go up, but still very, very large. Okay, so we call this, this is the original entrance, and this entrance is called the robber's entrance. So what I want to talk about next is the story of this robber's entrance. Okay, so this poses a real puzzle because as we'll talk about in just a moment, a Muslim caliph of Cairo wanted to send his engineers into this pyramid in order to discover the treasures of Pharaoh Khufu's burial chamber. So that's where we get the term robber's entrance, is that most people believe that his engineers began tunneling into the pyramid because the entrance was hidden and they had no idea where it was, and so they begin digging into the body of the pyramid, hoping to be able to find uh, passageways that would lead to the burial chamber. Okay, so that begs the question, of course, of if they didn't know where that opening was, where that entrance was, how did they guess so closely? In other words, with all the vast acreage, so to speak, of the surface of the pyramid to, to uh, hide an entrance in, how'd they know where to begin tunneling into it in order to make their way into the passages that would lead to the burial chamber? And so the very fact that this is so precisely positioned relative to uh, the, the original entrance leads people, including myself, to question how was that even possible? So that's what I want to discuss next. So what we want to look at here is how did these engineers, these grave robbers for the Sultan, get into the pyramid? How did they find the burial chamber? Okay, so I did some research on this in order to try to figure all this out and try to make some sense out of these, uh, this enigma, this puzzle. And so I want to lay that out for you today. So the caliph was a fellow by the name of Al-Mamun, and this was 9th century A.D., 820 A.D. So Al-Mamun knew of the rumors of this vast and rich treasure that, uh, Kuf, that was buried in Khufu's chamber along with his sarcophagus. And so what he wanted to do was to send his workmen, his engineers, into the pyramid searching for that treasure. So the location of their so-called robber's entrance here is just simply too precise to be sheer guesswork. There's no way that they could have guessed that precisely. So what really happened here? The point is, is they didn't enter that way. They didn't dig a hole and tunnel it into the pyramid. They simply went through the doorway that was already there. Now, this would surprise most people, thinking that, well, they must have hidden that doorway in order to prevent grave robbers. But that's not the case. Okay? There was a known doorway leading into the descending passageway. And this was a known doorway. It wasn't hidden at all. Very much like this one, probably. This is from Menkare's pyramid, and it shows you how very obvious the entrance is here. There's no attempt to hide that. 
And so I'm suspecting that the Great Pyramid's entrance would have been very similar. So with Photoshop, I've made my own version of the original entrance. All right, just guessing here, but uh, trying to uh, create something that would have a nice smooth masonry and an obvious doorway. Now, another reason that we are pretty sure that there was a doorway there is that uh, a Greek geographer by the name of Strabo described a swiveling door that could be opened very easily leading into the descending passageway. So I did a little animation of that. So here the door swivels upward on hinges and allows entrance into the descending passageway. So this was all known. There was nothing hidden about it. Okay. So it leads to the descending passageway as would be expected. So down to the burial chamber down here, but everybody knew by the, uh, up to that point that there was nothing in this burial chamber because it was unfinished. So Mamoun's, Al Mamoun's engineers didn't bother to go down there and check it out because they knew that the, the, the final resting place of the pharaoh was not down at the bottom of the descending passageway. Okay. So this was a well-known passage at the time, but keep in mind that it was the only known passage at the time. Now today, of course, we know of those additional passages, but Al Mamun's engineers didn't. All they knew was the doorway leading to the descending passage. However, they knew that there was, needed to be another passage, an ascending one. And that begs the question of how do they know that, right? And they knew that because the architects and planners of the Great Pyramid built a trial model of the inside passages. Now, again, many people aren't aware of this, but it's not too far out in front of the pyramid itself. And so in order to work out the, the uh, configuration and mechanics of building these inside passages, these inner corridors, the uh, chief architect built a trial model in the bedrock not too far away. And of course, everybody knew where that was too. It wasn't hidden. And so this is the way that that looked. Here's my model of uh, that the trial passage. So let's dissolve the front of it away. And you can see here what that trial passage looks like. So here's the desert floor, the bedrock, and you've got an entrance that leads down into the descending passage, right? So this represented the descending passage. But everyone knew that this also had an ascending passage here, okay? Because it was part of the trial model. And then as uh, at the top of that ascending passage was a horizontal passage. Okay, that's gonna go ultimately to the queen's chamber, right? And then here's the opening into the desert floor. So Mamun's engineers knew that this configuration must be related to the configuration of passages within the body of the pyramid. They just didn't know where, the, and you have to ignore this vertical shaft here, that there's nothing that corresponds to that. And uh, scholars, researchers don't know what that was for, if anything. But in any case, they knew that there was an ascending passage, but they didn't know where it was. Okay, it could be anywhere along here, right? Because this isn't to scale, of course. So they didn't know where that ascending passage would be. So that was their challenge, was to try to find that ascending passage and where it joined with the descending passage. So this remained hidden from them, and that was the object of their search. It wasn't a question of finding the door, and then finding their way down to the burial chamber there, that was all known already. So what they did is apparently, and we don't know exactly because they didn't record it, but it would make some sense that knowing that there was an opening on the ceiling of the descending passage, perhaps by simply testing the ceiling stones, tapping on those stones, they were able to discover a capstone. Okay, so what I've done here is to uh, use Photoshop to create a capstone here. 
and that perhaps because it sounded differently when they were tapping on it, you see, they were able to, to discern that there was a capstone of subtype right here. So they removed that. Okay. It blocked access to this granite plug that sat in the opening of that ascending passage. So there's the ascending passage, but it's blocked by this very tightly fit granite stone. So, as it turns out, Al Mamun's engineers couldn't remove it. It's too difficult to remove. So, what they did instead was to dig around the plug. It turned out that there were three of them there. So, they simply excavated a passageway around the uh, block. So, here's the top. There's three granite plugs here. This is the topmost one, and there's the end of it right there. You can see these stairs coming up. So they dug around, they dug this passage around, and lo and behold, there was the beginning of the ascending passage. So they were able to discover where the ascending passage was by doing that, and then they went ahead and climbed on up to the burial chamber and investigated it. Not much to their disappointment, as many of you may already know, there was nothing in it except a sarcophagus. We'll talk about that a little bit more in a bit. But, as they reported, there was nothing in the burial chamber. So then they exited the pyramid. Now, it is at this point that the, the uh, robber's tunnel was created. But why, nobody knows for sure. The speculation is, is that they did find something in there, in the burial chamber, that was too long to negotiate the corner that you see right here. Couldn't negotiate the corner. Uh, and so in order to get that thing out, whatever it was, and nobody has any clue as to what it might have been, but perhaps something like the lid of the sarcophagus, maybe, because as you'll see in a minute, the sarcophagus doesn't have a lid uh, any longer. And so, but whatever it was, apparently, they were trying to get around this rather acute corner right here couldn't do it because maybe the object was too long, so simply dug a passage straight out from there to the surface. And here's the passage that they dug. And of course, it ended here with the so-called robber's entrance. So that explains the accuracy of the robber's entrance. It wasn't dug to get in. It was dug to get out. Now, it'd be interesting to know all of the facts associated with that, but I find that to be rather a fascinating a story of the, of the entry into the pyramid by Al Mamun's engineers. Okay, so now let's take a little tour. Now that we can get into the pyramid, let's go in through the entrance, uh, and that will lead us directly into the descending passage. And this is an image of the descending passage. Now, this may seem a little surprising to, to you, because notice the, the tourist here that's going down the, the, the descending passage. This, is, this passage is only about four feet tall. So, therefore, very, very difficult to climb down and back up again. Of course, originally it would have just been a smooth ramp, but now I've got, got wooden stairs in there now, so tourists can go up and down to visit this uh, underground passage if you so desire. All right, so one of the things that is most catches most tourists off guard is the fact that these passages, once you get to this point, these passages are very, very low. So that's the descending passage. Then here we see the underground chamber, and you can see that it is unfinished. Didn't get very far in terms of carving that out, before the pharaoh had the engineer stop working on it and begin build, working on the tombs inside the pyramid instead. So then back up here, where the ascending passage meets the descending, once again, this entire length of passage, a corridor, is again about four feet high. So in order to climb those steps, it's quite challenging to tell you the truth. You have to kind of double over, obviously, and crouch and climb up those steps. 
uh, I can tell you from, uh, from experience that by the time you get to this point where you can stand up again, your thighs are pretty well exercised and burning. So in any case, that's the ascending passage. Okay, then at that point, uh, the engineers made this horizontal passage leading over to the so-called Queen's Chamber. So if we look at the Queen's Chamber, it, as you can see, is fairly finished. Now I stuck a little Egyptian guard in there so that you can have some idea of uh, uh, the scale of this uh, corbelled arch that you see here and of the burial chamber. Okay, so that's the Queen, the so-called Queen Chamber. Now, it was never intended, most scholars agree, it was never intended to contain the sarcophagus of a queen, but has been given that name just because it's smaller than the king's chamber. So here again you see the entrance coming in, very low entrance, leading in from this horizontal passage into the chamber. So once you negotiate the ascending passage, then you enter into the grand gallery, and at last you can stand up. Now keep in mind again, the stairs and railings obviously would not have been there. It was just a smooth ramp uh, from, from top all the way to the bottom. And it's fairly, a fairly steep angle. But you can see the advantage here, the unique characteristic of the Grand Gallery and why it's called the Grand Gallery, is it's built of a, in a corbelled construction technique of these stones that gradually move in toward each other as the, as the gallery ascends they finally meet up here at the top. This is about 20 feet high. Uh, and so a grand gallery indeed. Uh, again, uh, engineers and scholars and historians are still trying to figure out the purpose for the grand gallery, why it's so different from these others that exist in the pyramid, and why this one's so tall. Nobody really knows the answer to that. But once you reach the top, then you have another small corridor that leads into the burial chamber. So here's an Im image of that doorway, and you can again see how very small it is and cramped. So you have to kind of duck walk or just crouch or crawl through that opening to get into the chamber. Then once you are in the chamber, then it's very expansive, 34 feet by 17 feet by 20 feet high. And so this is what greeted, undoubtedly, what greeted Al-Mamun's men once they came in through the doorway. And that entrance is right over here, just outside the, this right-hand corner of the, of the photograph. Uh, everything that you see in here is granite. So you can see granite blocks uh, that are made for the floor, the ceiling, and the walls. Everything is granite. So remember, all of that granite was brought 500 miles downstream to the building site from the quarries at Aswan. Uh, and each of these took, on average, five to seven years to create so they could be brought here and put into place in, as part of the king's burial chamber. Okay. Now, one of the things that people often note is that there are there's no paintings on the walls, there's no... There's no hieroglyphics, no decoration of any kind. So that, that, in addition to the fact that when Al-Mamun's men broke into this chamber for the, apparently the first time, there was nothing there. Now, this is, raises one of the great enigmas of the Great Pyramid of Khufu, and that is, is this truly the burial chamber? Because according to Al-Mamun's men, nothing was in here. And yet, when archaeologists have opened up other tombs for the Egyptian uh, pharaohs, even though they had been looted of their treasures, the, the looters didn't take everything, didn't empty the chamber, right? They left behind all kinds of debris and shambles. You know, they didn't want the beds, and they didn't want the pots, and they didn't want the disassembled chariots and they didn't want the, the weapons of war and all that. They were after treasure, none of this other stuff. They just left all that behind. And so in the modern era, when archaeologists enter or discover or explore a pharaonic tomb, there's usually stuff that's been left behind there unless it had some value to the ancient peoples. But in the case of Khufu's burial chamber, perfectly 
bear. Now that has led some people, as they say, to speculate that maybe this wasn't the burial chamber at all. I mean, he did change his mind two times and to come up with this uh, final resting place. Maybe he changed his mind a third time and has another chamber somewhere else within the pyramid that does contain his unrifled, unlooted uh, stores of treasure and his body and so on. That's the big speculation and that's what everybody is searching to find out now, trying to find the answer to that. But, quite frankly, one of the justifications for declaring that this was not a tomb is, is the lack of decoration. But that doesn't hold any water because in these early days, these tombs weren't decorated anyway. That happens much later in the Old Kingdom when you start to get hieroglyphics and carvings and paintings on the walls of the burial chambers. So the lack of decoration here is expected. However, what isn't expected is the sarcophagus here. So if we look at the sarcophagus up closer, okay, you can see that it has been damaged. A corner of it has been broken off. Most scholars today believe that it was Al Mamun's men that broke that corner off. Perhaps it was in an attempt to get the heavy sarcophagus lid off the top. So the assumption is, is that there was a lid there originally when the when the caliph's men broke into the chamber, there was a lid there and they pried it off and in doing so broke a corner of the sarcophagus. Now the lid is a mystery also because there's no evidence of that lid anywhere. The thing that's unusual about it is, first of all, if Mamun's men wanted to take it off, why did they want to do that? Well, of course, to see inside the sarcophagus, right? See if the body of the king was there. It wasn't. The lid was there, but no body inside. But maybe there was something special about the lid? I don't know, but the point here is that, was that the object that they needed to, to excavate that straight tunnel out to the robber's entrance? Is that the object that they were taking out? Possibly it was that lid or something else. If it wasn't that, then the other possibility as to what happened to the lid was that it was broken up so that it be, could be taken out through those tiny little corridors uh, to outside. Why would they want to do that? And why would they need to dig that straight passage to the exterior? I, who knows? The, the, the questions remain. The questions still, uh, there are more questions than there are answers when it comes to the, to the burial chamber of uh, the pharaoh Khufu. Why couldn't they just leave some information behind somewhere to help us understand this stuff? But another thing I want you to look at here is that we look as you look inside the sarcophagus, remember this is granite and they are, and they are working this with copper tools, which can't cut granite. Okay, so if that's the case, why do you have such sharp, clean, straight edges here with absolutely smooth sides that are like precision cut? So here again, you get the alien theorists saying, well, they used alien laser beams to do that work with. Well, you we can dismiss that for certain, but how did they do it? It's a real, it's a real uh, uh, challenging question. Like I say, when we get to looking at the obelisks, which are all made of granite also, we'll talk about methods that the Egyptians used in order to, to shape granite. But that still begs the question of how they got these inner corners so precisely made. But we'll talk more about that a little bit later on and give you something to think about meanwhile. The last thing we want to look at is the... Is the uh, relieving stones above the burial chamber. There are 80 ton, these stones here are 80 tons a piece. And as you can see, there are one, two, three, four, five of them. Okay, five of these 80 ton blocks of stone. And that's just vertically. When you go horizontally, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, about eight or nine of them horizontally. And every story has that same 
number of stones. So significant effort has gone into the building of this part of the burial chamber, this, this uh, relieving chamber, so to speak. And then the top of it was uh, covered, again, by the uh, gabled uh, beams, like we saw at the entrance, the original entrance had these gabled uh, beams that were uh, stood on top of the entire chamber with stone, of course, built all around them. Now, the reason why they're doing this is because the ceiling, as you noticed in our, the last image of the chamber, the ceiling is flat. It's not arched, it's not corbelled, but is a flat ceiling. Now, a flat ceiling, the problem with a flat ceiling is the weight on top of it can cause it to break, crack in the middle if it doesn't have interior supports, which this one doesn't. So, how does the engineer, how did the architect provide for what was necessary to keep them from cracking from the weight of the stone above? Well, if the stone of the pyramid, the mass of the pyramid here, which is a lot of weight of stone up above it here, if that was all resting on these blocks, they would have collapsed, would have cracked in two. But that's what these relieving stones are for. 2,100 tons of granite. And the gabled design of the roof here is to help relieve the pressure on the granite beams of the ceiling. But one of the questions is, is why, if, if that's the case, why do you need so many layers? Why not just take that gabled structure and put it right down here over the top of this beam or maybe over the top of that one but why so many well it's an interesting question that again engineers try to resolve and they think they have a pretty good idea of why this was done and that is there's lots of weight on the ceiling from all the stone above it obviously so one of the things that the gable does is to divert the pressure of those stones off to the side just like a relieving arch would do. Okay, So the weight's coming down, hits the top of the gable here, and then is, the weight is diverted to either side of the burial chamber just like an arch functionally. So it's to remove the stress from that flat ceiling. But why so many layers? Maybe it was to prevent lateral stress on the grand gallery. In other words, if this gable was down this low, the pressures would have been coming down here and then off to the side, and that might put undue pressure on the, this grand gallery. So in order to relieve the pressure there, you raise the direction of the stresses up higher to avoid uh, the grand gallery. Again, speculation, but does make some sense. Now, the last thing that I want to address here is blocking that passageway, because remember, you have those three granite blocks in the, in the ascending passageway that Al-Mamun's men couldn't remove. So here's my little animation of the way those blocking stones were put into place. So as this was all being built, of course, the blocking stones were put into place pre-cut and ready to block the passageway as the pyramid rose up around it. So then once everything was completed, then these stones were released from their position here and slid down the passageway to there, which is where Mamun's men found them. They couldn't get through them, so they had to dig around them. So obviously, it, to release those stones, there had to be some men in here, some workers, that uh, were that released the stones to block the passageway but they were not intended to die in there trapped inside the pyramid so there was this provision made for them as the pyramid was built this passageway this escape route was built into the pyramid as well so that the workers could after releasing the stones could go down to the descending passage uh, down near the burial chamber and then make their way up and outside. So nobody was left trapped inside to die in the service of the Pharaoh blocking up his passage. Now there's still plenty of questions that remain to be resolved about all of this, but we'll probably never know the, the final answer uh, until we're, uh, the Egyptian government allows more investigation of the pyramid through ultrasonic 
uh, ground penetrating, muon pe uh, penetrating kind of technologies. Uh, and so far they haven't allowed that. So it, it remains a, 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 an intriguing question about the Pyramid of Khufu. Is his burial chamber still to be found somewhere else within the pyramid? And remember, I told you last lecture that Scan Pyramid Project has found some voids in the pyramid, and perhaps those voids have something to do with this whole issue. But the Egyptian government has not given permission yet to follow further that track of investigation for whatever reason. Okay, so we'll finish it up here just by reminding you of the evolution of the pyramid shape. Uh, as an example of the power of tradition in Egyptian society. So the whole thing is inspired by the Ben Ben ultimately. Okay, but the first stage, the earthen mound, that's not inspired by the Ben Ben yet, but it's a burial pit below ground. And then from there we go to the Mastaba, that is a formal version of that earthen mound with burial chamber below ground. And then that leads us to the third stage of the evolution, the stepped pyramid, a grandiose version of the stacked mastabas with their burial chamber underground, and then finally the fourth and last stage, the true pyramid, which is perhaps even from the, the stepped pyramid onward, is inspired by the Ben Ben. Again, speculation, but interesting speculation nevertheless. So next lecture, I'll take a look at the end of the Old Kingdom, and then the transition to the Middle Kingdom, a fascinating period of time in Egyptian history that, again, is a, a period that very few people are aware of uh, at all. So I'll talk to you then.